this is um, uh, our first lesson on uh, professional practice, procedure, and ethics. Uh, I'll be taking you for this lesson. My name is Dr. Mwenda Makadimo. Welcome. Uh, we will start with the code of ethics for valuers uh, uh, from the International Valuation Standards uh, Commission, uh, or rather International Valuation Standards Council, uh, because this is the council, this is the body that, that uh, regulates the conduct of all valuers internationally and all member organizations for each country are members of this council. And it's the one that sets international valuation standards uh, for all practicing valuers, for all uh, people who um, consume valuation services. And as you're very well aware, as real estate professionals, you can be a member of um, several disciplines. You could go and choose the line of being a real estate valuer. You could be a real estate manager. You could also be a building surveyor and you could also be a facilities manager or even a project manager. These uh, disciplines including the one on land management surveying are the ones that encompass uh, the disciplines which you can practice as a graduate of real estate. And therefore, we have today chosen to discuss the code of ethics and principles and procedures that relate to one of the disciplines, which is the valuation uh, discipline. And this discipline, as you very well know, globally is um, led by this International Valuation Standards uh, Council uh, that gives the modes of practice, the principles and procedures to be followed by all valuers. Therefore, we will go through these standards today and discuss each one of them, including the guidance, the threats, and any safeguards that a professional valuer ought to embrace so that then they behave in the manner that is required professionally. So we will uh, therefore start with what this code is about. And this code uh, is, is seeks to achieve uh, or create and maintain the international evaluation standards. It also seeks to issue technical guidance for professional valuers and promote the development of the evaluation profession and ethical practices globally. And the code consists of first the fundamental principles, then the fundamental principles guidance, and the threats and safeguards. We will start with the fundamental principles. The fundamental principles consist of five principles of conduct to which a professional valuer is expected to adhere when providing evaluation service. So in essence, when providing evaluation service, there are principles that you are required to adhere to. And also it identifies the categories and threats that may compromise a professional valuer's ability to comply with the principles and the types of safeguards that are appropriate to avoid or mitigate those threats. Also, there's a discussion on how these principles and, uh, and, 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 and uh, guidance are applied <clears throat> and in, in, in regard to professional valuers' ability to comply with each one of them and the steps that should be taken to avoid those threats. The code applies to all member organizations, all professional organizations. And I said, for instance, the, in Kenya, the professional member organization that deals with valuation is the Institution of Surveyors of Kenya, Valuers Chapter. And also the uh, body that regulates that is the Valuers Registration Board, 
So it is the one that regulates this conduct. And therefore, these rules apply to uh, that body that governs how valuation is practiced in Kenya, and they have been adopted by the institution of surveyors of Kenya and also by the valuers registration board. The fundamental principles guidance and the discussions in the in this guidance uh, are, are not applicable. Uh, where professional valuer is subject to rules of evaluation professional organization other than the ones that are stated here. So the code re uh, makes reference to a professional valuer are uh, those that have been outlined by the council and um, a competency framework for professional valuers, uh, depending on the context, maybe an individual person, a firm, could also be applicable and could also be um, referenced to in the case of a practicing value, provided that it does not contradict this um, uh, code. The fundamental principles uh, are necessary because uh, it is fundamental to the integrity of valuation process that those who rely on the valuation and, uh, that, uh, and the reports that valuers give have confidence in the work that valuers do and that the skills that valuers exercise are such that they resort to the most dependable outcomes and to the best judgments. Uh, and therefore, uh, professionals are required to follow some ethical principles to ensure that their work brings out this uh, outcome that uh, displays dependability, acceptability, and satisfaction of the client's objectives and expectations. And these principles include first, integrity. One uh, has to be straightforward and honest in professional and business relationships. That's what integrity means, honesty, straightforwardness, and uh, dealing in, with your work in manners that do not uh, compromise your behavior. The other one is objectivity, means that you have to uh, act without a conflict of interest, that you will not have biased judgment, that uh, the, 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 the decision that you make is free from bias and is not influenced by any other relationships and is only informed by facts and facts that uh, systematically lead you to making that judgment. Uh, the other uh, principle is that of competence. For you to practice valuation, you must have the skills. You must be trained. You, you must uh, be able to exercise skills that are, are, uh, you have built or you have acquired. If you do not have skills in a particular manner, then you're not obliged to undertake a certain assignment which you feel incompetent to handle because it is expected as a professional you will have the competence, the requisite competence that is required for you to be able to exercise that skill and bring the outcomes that satisfy the requirements of the client and the requirements of law and professional uh, standards. So this a competence could be in form of skills, practice, techniques, the laws that have been set, or uh, any other experience that is needed to carry out that particular assignment. Then you also have to observe the principle of confidentiality. Evaluation work and valuation assignments are done for particular purposes and for particular people. So you do not disclose uh, that report or the results to unauthorized people. You must maintain confidentiality. It is not to be made public unless it is authorized. So therefore, you do not disclose the information acquired because of the position of being a professional valuer to any other person because in that position of being a valuer, you have... Uh, advantage your private to private information relating people's property, so relating to people's status, relating to uh, people's rights uh, uh, and, and entities' rights that 
if you go disclosing, may be prejudicial or may be injurious to their interest or to their needs. So therefore, you must maintain confidentiality and only uh, release the results or the reports or information to authorized persons only. And acting in, in, in a manner that displays professional behavior. Professional behavior is the, the other principle. One has to act diligently to produce work in a timely manner, in accordance with applicable legal requirements, technical and professional standards, and to always act in public interest and to avoid any action that discredits the profession. It means you must not bring the profession of valuation into disrepute. You must not uh, do anything that would be regarded as unprofessional. So this, this is what that, that principle entails, uh, but uh, we will nonetheless discuss it in, in detail. So this, this principles, the guidance into these principles is designed to assist professional valuers with the approach that should be taken to applying the fundamental principles and to identify evaluate and address threats to their ability to comply with the fundamental principles. The circumstances which professional valuers operate may create specific threats to compliance with these fundamental principles. And some common types of threats are identified uh, uh, in this code and the way to go about addressing those threats is also cited. When a professional identifies those threats, then they, they need to find ways of addressing those threats so that they don't hinder them from acting or producing professional results as required by law and the professional standards. The threats and safeguards. Now, there are several threats as I have said earlier, uh, that a professional would face in their practice. In fact, once you, you go to the real world and you leave school, there will be so many threats that come the way of making you deviate from professional standards and from the professional code. And we need to know these threats in advance so that then you can be fully armed uh, with strategies of overcoming them. Those threats could be like one, self-interest. Self-interest threat. The threat that a financial or other interest will inappropriately influence the professional valuer's judgment or behavior. For instance, you might be uh, seeking to make money, a lot of money. You are aiming to maximize money. And then somebody comes and says, yeah, for you to do this, I'll give you additional money. Yeah? Or you are even doing another assignment that you require some advantages. So that is self-interest. It is you as the professional who has those interests. And you have to guard yourself from being influenced by professional, I mean from self-interest to compromise the professional or public interests. The, the self-view threats that the threat that a professional valuer will not appropriately evaluate the results of a previous judgment made or service performed by another individual with the same firm or employing organization on which the valuer may rely on when forming a judgment as part of avoiding uh, a current service. So instead of having uh, the objective view, then you get another uh, way of reviewing uh, your, your work or reviewing previous work, self-review threat. If you did other work and you, you want to stick to the other, other work, if you made that mistake and you want to carry it forward, then that could be a threat. Client conflict threats, where your client uh, then as maybe a, a, a conflict of interest or as a conflicting view. For instance, you could be having facts informing you that this property 
uh, would attract this value. But the client wants that property to be valued higher because they are seeking to make more money or to borrow a loan from, say, a bank for a higher value so that they get that benefit. So their interest is conflicting with a professional interest. Or that client could be uh, is the owner of that property and they could also be uh, represented in the client's uh, uh, board. Say, if somebody is a, a director in a bank and they are borrowing from that bank and they are the owner of a property. So in this, in this case, they are both uh, the bank and they are the client and therefore they are conflicted. So when you are carrying out your valuation or that exercise, you must not put that conflict into, um, into context or into, 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 into consideration. You have to exercise independent professional judgment. The advocacy threat is another threat. The threat that a professional valuer will promote a client or employee's position to the point that the objectivity is compromised. For instance, if somebody wants to paint a certain picture, maybe if you're doing uh, evaluation for court purposes, and somebody has gone to court and they want to justify a certain position, and then they put that pressure on you as the valuer to carry that position, I think then that would be against, that would be one of the threats. The other threat is the familiarity threat. For instance, if you know people, or if you know their client, instead of exercising independent judgment, you want to say, this is my friend, this is my, uh, my acquaintance. So that must be avoided. The other one is intimidation. Sometimes valuers get assignments from people who are aggressive, people who have higher power, maybe political power, maybe economic power, so they can intimidate the valuer such that the valuer then doesn't act professionally. And this, this is a threat that the valuer will be uh, deterred from acting objectively because the actual or perceived pressure, including attempts to exercise a new influence over the valuation opinion that the valuer will render. So then what are the safeguards against these threats? The safeguards against these threats, uh, of course, are many. They are several, but today we will just highlight the ones that are in this, this code. Um, the, 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 the valuer ought to work or be in a professional body so that then this professional body, the rules that the professional body give are the ones that guide you or the internal workings and procedures of the farms. There are controls within the farm such that there could be somebody else who reviews the work by putting in internal controls. Another valuer could be asking the questions. Another valuer might require some empirical information. And the safeguard, other safeguards that you could have is a regulation on the corporate structure and governance of farms providing uh, evaluation services, where if it is, there is a valuation assistant, then there is a supervisor, there is a director who signs, so that then there is accountability throughout so that some of these things are eliminated. The other one is statutory licensing of valuers for certain types of valuation, so that you have the legal licensing, so that if you act in a certain manner, then your license can be withdrawn. Or for you to get a license, then you need to behave in a certain manner. Like in Kenya, there is the Valuers Registration Board that licenses. And uh, Valuers Act uh, provides that, uh, uh, that you will not be licensed unless you behave in a certain manner. So this statutory requirement and the threat that you could be struck off the license makes you remember that you have to act uh, objectively. Then there is regulations on education, training, and uh, requirements for people who are doing professional services. For instance, so that you avoid those biases and lack of competence and all that, the regulations require you to cover certain aspects so that you gain certain skills. And then there is also regulations on continuous professional development so that you are able to 
get new skills, get methodologies, get things that help you remove yourself from the subjective uh, biases or subjective influences then, that then would uh, influence uh, the outcome. External review or by a legally empowered third party of the valuations so that you have um, you could have an external reviewer who then questions and brings in some control uh, so to ensure that the facts put and the, the results and the quality standards are ensured like almost like uh, an audit uh, for sort of sort in case um, it is viewed that one might have failed the test of complying with the, with the principles that have been set out in the code. Uh, the requirement to comply with professional standards and the, the disciplinary procedures that are placed, put in place and the rules on the basis of remuneration for valuation assignments. If you have rules on how you charge your fees, then it means you not earn any more money and clients will not be influenced to pay you more money than is required. For instance, in Kenya, there is a uh, schedule of fees that is given by the Valuers Act and you have to comply by that. So Kenya has done very, very well in putting that uh, uh, in, in place. The requirement of min maintaining a register of the material personal interests and prof for professional valuers and other staff engaged in valuation assignments. For instance, it could be known what, what properties a valuer own, what, 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 where do they come, where is it, so that then they are not um, sent to assignments where they have interests. For instance, if you hold, hold uh, shares in a particular company, then you cannot be sent to value the assets of that company that you hold uh, shares. So a requirement also for what we said internal peer review, where a valuer of the same qualification reviews the other valuers, but internally. And also, um, uh, periodic changing of the valuer's responsibilities and scope so that no one uh, handles a certain client for too long, so that there is that movement, that periodic changing, it, it really uh, helps. Um, controls on accepted uh, uh, gifts or hospitality, so that then you're told what you can accept and what you can't as accept. For instance, uh, you know, clients can come with gifts. They can give people money. Others can uh, give uh, people uh, gifts in terms of uh, uh, personal effects, clothes, uh, money, cars, and other ornamentals. You know, you could be given a necklace and other things. So you could come up with a regulation that uh, does not allow you to receive any gifts from uh, a client. And if somebody has gifts, the way they give it to the organization. In fact, like in Kenya, the public service um, uh, uh, code requires that if somebody has gifts, they give them to the entity, to the organization. And you cannot accept those personal gifts. That controls... Uh, the influence that the client then would have on you in terms of gifts. Um, of course, these safeguards are not intended, are not exhaustive. The ones we are discussing, many more could be built, and their effectiveness, of course, depends on the willingness of the organization, the willingness of the of of the employee, the. Uh, uh, the, 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 the compliance uh, and, and, and how they are known and publicized. So this, these uh, safeguards may increase the lively, likelihood of identifying or deterring an ethical behavior and therefore um, you need to ensure that you have them in place. Now, beyond the safeguards, we have the fundamental principles that we mentioned earlier that we need to discuss the details of each and they will help situating the context of applying the safeguards and the context of the threats uh, on each of the principles that were outlined earlier. 
For instance, integrity, we start with integrity. This principle requires or imposes an obligation on all professional valuers to be straightforward and honest in all professional and business relationships. Integrity also applies to fair dealing and truthfulness. It means you will speak the truth. You will deal with people fairly. You will be fair in terms of administrative procedures, technical procedures, and also any personal uh, engagements that you may have in relation to the profession. Professional valuers should not knowingly be associated with the valuation report containing evaluation, a reference to evaluation, or any other communication about evaluation. They believe that it either contains a statement or information that are materially false or misleading, or that are made recklessly, or omits or obscures information required to be included, where such omission or obscurity would be misleading. So integrity requires that you do not mislead. If a professional valuer becomes aware that they have been associated with such information, they should take immediate steps to be disassociated from that information, for example, by issuing a modified valuation uh, report. That, that way, you'll be, the valuer will be able to correct uh, that information. So the next principle that we need to discuss in detail is the one on objectivity. And uh, the principle of objectivity imposes an obligation on the professional valuer not to compromise their professional or business judgment because of bias, conflicts of interest, or the undue influence of others. So therefore, a professional valuer may be exposed to situations that may impair objectivity. It is impractical to define and prescribe all situations to which a professional valuer may be exposed that would create a threat to objectivity. Some threats to objectivity are incapable of avoidance or mitigation. And where this is the case, the professional valuer should decline the assignment. This is important. If you can't avoid the compromise on objectivity, you refuse the assignment. However, some potential threats to objectivity may be either eliminated or effectively mitigated by safeguards. These safeguards can include appropriate disclosure of the threat to the relevant parties and obtaining their consent to proceed with evaluation assignment. Uh, assignment. Other safeguards are, as was discussed before, the examples of situations could potentially impose a threat to which uh, should uh, prompt a professional valuer to consider either declining an assignment or adopting a safeguard to eliminate or avoid any threat or a perception of bias that includes one request to produce valuations for the buyer and the seller of an asset in a transaction. You cannot produce valuations for the two because the interest of the buyer and the interest of the seller conflict. Or request to produce valuations for two or more parties competing for an opportunity. So if people are competing for the same asset or the opportunity, you cannot be the valuer for the two. Requesting to value for, request to value for a lender where advice is also being provided to the borrower. Again, I said that if you are valuing for the lender, don't value for the, for the borrower. Undertaking evaluation for a third party consumption where the professional valuer's firm has other substantial fee earning or relationships with the commissioning client. So if the client is paying you in another capacity, then you cannot undertake this assignment that is instructed by a different party uh, to evaluate the interest or the, the assets of the person who substantially pays you, you should refuse that assignment. Providing recurring valuations of the same asset and less controls are in place to minimize the risk of self-review. So if you keep, you are the only one valuing that asset year in, year out, you are likely to just copy what was there last year and continue so that there is no other opinion. That's the threat of self-review. Requests for a professional valuer to act as an advocate 
and as an expert in relation to the same matter. So if you are an advocate, you cannot then be the valuer. That's what I said, uh, conflict in, in relation to advocacy. The extent to which any of the uh, preceding examples will compromise the professional valuer's objectivity will depend upon the circumstances of each case. So you have to look at case by case circumstance and be able to make the requisite decision. The extent to which the preceding examples, uh, of course I said, will depend on the circumstances of each case and the purpose of evaluation, the client's objectives and the practicability of eliminating or reducing the threat to acceptable level by putting in place procedural standards. In many cases, previous involvement with an asset presents no threat to objectivity and the knowledge it provides may actually enhance the ability of the professional valuer to provide an objective opinion. In considering whether our, uh, a situation creates a threat uh, to their objectivity, a professional valuer should recognize that it is often the perception of possible bias by others that creates the threat to the credibility of the valuation. There will be situations where some past or current involvement with either of the asset to be valued or a party interested in that asset creates no material threat to the objectivity by which could give rise to a perception of bias if, a sub subsequent, uh, if it is subsequently discovered by a party who has relied on the valuation. Disclosure of any such involvement in the scope of work and report can be an effective means of avoiding any perception of bias. So you have to disclose if you have been involved in evaluation, if you have been involved in an asset, you, when you have disclosed you have been involved, so the consumer of your report will very well know that uh, you had a relationship and they can be able to use the results of your evaluation uh, with that knowledge. Other examples of other safeguards to prevent or minimize bias or perception include ensuring that the professional valuer and all those assisting with evaluation are operationally separate from departments providing potentially conflicting services within the same firm, disclosure of other fee-earning relationship with the commissioning client where the evaluation may be relied upon by a third party. Where regular recurring valuations are provided of the same asset, possible safeguards against the threat to objectivity arising from self-review include providing for periodic peer review by a valuer or valuers unconnected with the assignment or periodically changing the professional valuer responsible for the assignment within that firm. If a professional valuer considers that a threat to the objectivity can be eliminated or effectively mitigated by disclosure of a cause of a threat and any other safeguards taken or proposed, care should be taken not to breach the principle of confidentiality. If past involvement with an asset or a party interest in the asset cannot be disclosed without breaching the continuing duty of confidentiality to another client, the assignment should be declined. If a professional valuer considers that a threat to objectivity can be eliminated or effectively managed by reaching an agreement that they may proceed with the two or more parties with potentially conflicting interests in either of the outcomes of the valuation or the subject asset, care should be taken to ensure that the parties are properly informed and they are aware of the potential consequences for their interest in consenting to the professional valuer being appointed. Obtaining the agreement from the two interested parties that a valuation assignment can be accepted does not absolve the professional valuer from the duty to comply with the free fundamental principles. If no satisfactory safeguards to eliminate or minimize the threat to objectivity can be identified, the professional valuer should decline the assignment. So this, 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 this has to be very, very clear. You notice the word decline the assignment is repeatedly uh, mentioned in this principle, under this principle. It is because objectivity is at the core of producing evaluation report that is professional and that can be relied upon in decision making. It is such a strong principle. That's why it is advised where objectivity cannot be assured or where there can be perceptions that it lacks, then the valuer is safer 
uh, rejecting or declining that assignment. The principle of competence. It requires that a professional valuer should maintain professional knowledge and skill at the level required to ensure that clients or employers receive competent professional services. To act in accordance with applicable technical and professional standards where providing professional services is uh, required is a key fundamental principle. So it is therefore important for the valuer to have the required skills. Competent professional service requires exercise of sound judgment in applying professional knowledge and skill in the performance of such service. Professional competence may be divided into two separate phases. Attainment of professional competence and maintenance of professional competence. The maintenance of professional competence requires a continuing awareness and an understanding of relevant technical, professional, business developments. Continuing professional development enables professional valuers to develop and maintain cap capabilities to perform competently within the professional environment. What does this mean? It means you have to continue getting these skills after graduating. There are changes in the environment. There are changes in technology. There are changes in methodologies. There could be changes in standards. So it is important for the valuer to keep uh, uh, gaining new knowledge and maintaining the knowledge that they had by what is called pro continuous professional development. Diligence encompasses the responsibility to act in accordance with the requirements of an assignment, being careful, thorough, and acting on a timely basis. A professional valuer should take reasonable steps to ensure that those working under the professional valuer's authority in a professional capacity have appropriate training and supervision. So there is the training and the supervision. So if people are working under you, they must be trained and they must be effectively supervised. If a professional valuer does not have the professional knowledge and necessary experience to competently undertake valuation assignment that is offered, the professional valuer should decline the assignment. If one feels, for instance, you have no competence in carrying out, say, an assignment like rating, machinery or equipment valuation, or um, even mortgage valuation, or any other that uh, you feel you are inadequate as a valuer for that particular assignment, then it is better to decline and let another valuer with the competence undertake that assignment. If you feel you cannot deliver it in a timely, you cannot technically bring out the skills, you cannot uh, properly outline or do the analysis that is required, then decline the assignment and let those people with the skills and competencies handle the assignment. The other key principle is confidentiality. The principle of confidentiality imposes an obligation on all professional valuers to refrain from the following. One, disclosing outside the firm or employing organization confidential information acquired as a result of professional and business relationship without proper and specific authority unless there is a legal or a professional right or a duty to disclose. Notice, legal or professional right or a duty to disclose. And the key word is unless you are authorized. So you are either authorized by law or by the by duty that you have or by the authority within your firm. Using confidential information acquired as a result of professional and business relationship to the their personal advantages or advantages of that parties is also declined or is also stopped. So you should not use that information to your advantage or to the advantage of other parties. For instance, if you are valuing an asset for a company that is listing and you know that uh, the, 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 what will be listed will be uh, procuring these advantages and others, then you use that to uh, subscribe for those shares even before uh, the company is listed, then you're using it to your own advantage and having conflict. A professional valuer should maintain confidentiality, including in a social environment, 
being alert to the possibility of inadvertently disclosing particularly to close business associate or close immediate family member. So if you have sworn to professional confidentiality, you don't tell your sister, brother, wife, husband, children, you know, you leave professional matters in the office, you maintain that confidentiality. Or when you go to entertainment, you don't move from the office and then go to a pub and after hitting two, three drinks, there you are saying everything about your, 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 your client. Or you go to uh, 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 another social gathering and then you just spill that information to that social gathering. Whether social or uh, non-social, you're not supposed to disclose information uh, that you have attained from your professional practice or from your professional relationship unless authorized. A professional valuer should maintain confidentiality of all information uh, disclosed by prospective or client or even an employer. The valuer should maintain confidentiality of all information within the firm or the employing organization. They should take reasonable steps to ensure that the staff under professional valuer's control and from within, from whom advice and assistance is obtained, respect the professional valuer's duty to confidentiality. There are people who work under you, your assistants, could even be your driver, could be even somebody who binds your report or even carries the report to another. They also must understand and comply with this principle of confidentiality. The need to comply with this principle uh, continues even after the relationship is over between an, a, a valuer, a client, and an em employer. So you have to maintain this even after the relationship is, is over and should uh, uh, not breach it uh, after uh, uh, you have ended the relationship, even after the contract period, even after you stop um, uh, working for that employer, you don't disclose their information unless required by law or required by duty or authorized by them. These are examples of circumstances where valuers may be required to disclose confidential information when such disclosure may be appropriate. I've said there are times when that disclosure is required. When disclosure is permitted by law and is authorized by the client or employer. When disclosure is required by law, for example, the production of documents or the provision of evidence in course of a legal proceeding. For instance, if there is a case of fraud or acquisition that is with uh, legality is doubted, then a court of law might require to produce that. Disclosure of, of the appropriate public authorities of inf infringements of the law that come to light. Or when there is a professional duty or right to disclose when not prohibited by law. To comply with the quality, with the quality review of, evalua, of evaluation professional organization or other professional body, you may be required to disclose that information because a professional body may be seeking to know whether the work was done to a certain quality. Uh, you can also be required to disclose uh, in order to respond to an inquiry, an investigation by evaluation professional organization or the regulatory body. If there are questions as to the quality, as to the report, then you can disclose the materials. To protect the professional interests of a professional valuer in legal proceedings, if the valuer in legal proceedings needs to protect their interests, then they can disclose that information. Or to comply with technical standards and other ethical requirements. If ethical requirements requires you to disclosure, then you have to disclose. In deciding whether to disclose the information, the relevant factors to consider include whether the interest of all parties, including third parties whose interests may be affected, could be harmed if the clients or employees consent to the disclosure of the information made uh, by the professional valuer uh, is needed, whether all the relevant information is known and substantiated to the extent it is practicable, the type of communication that is expected and to whom it is addressed, whether the parties to whom the communication is addressed are appropriate recipients. Those, once you satisfy those, then you can disclose uh, with confidence that you're not breaching uh, the requirements for that fundamental uh, principle. The 
other one is professional behavior. The principle on professional behavior. The principle of professional behavior imposes an obligation on all professional valuers to act diligently in the service of their clients and to ensure that the services provided is in accordance with the legal, technical, and professional standards that are applicable either to the subject of evaluation and the purpose of evaluation or both. The professional behavior includes acceptance of responsibility and to act in public interest. A professional valuer's duty is not limited to satisfying the needs of a particular client or um, employer. There is also the need to consider that the professional decisions have a wider impact um, and, and, uh, and are frequently undertaken that can impact upon third parties like the public. So you have to have care for not just your employer, not just your client, but the wider public. In marketing and promoting themselves and their work, professional valuers should not bring the profession into disrepute. You don't go and advertise like a hawker. Sorry, I know hawkers have their rights, but if you are a professional, you have limits of how you conduct yourself. You don't go uh, begging and almost using methods that then bring the profession into uh, disrepute. You're not uh, expected to exaggerate any claims or any information you have or make any disparaging references to other valuers or to other parties. Professional behavior actually requires you to act responsibly and courteously in dealings with clients and the public at large and to respond promptly and effectively to the instructions that are reasonable or any complaints that arise that are reasonable. A professional evaluator should avoid any action that may discredit the profession. That's very, very important. Any action that may discredit the profession must be avoided. And, 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 and whether when you're dealing socially or when you're dealing professionally, any acts that may discredit the profession has to be uh, avoided. Thank you very much for listening to me and uh, you must remember that you have to always abide to the professional code so that you don't bring disrepute to the profession of evaluation and so that the contents and the services that you offer are regarded with respect and with the integrity that they deserve. Thank you very much. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.